everyone, Kevin Ellis here from the Land in New Homes Network and Thomas May. And in this edition of the Plotting Shed podcast, I'm joined by Matt Anderson and Andy Gray from our great friends at BBA Finance. And we're going to be talking all things refinance, stock levels, and lots, lots more. Um, and of course, it's the Christmas theme, uh, hence the Christmas jumper day. Okay, so we're here. It's Christmas edition. It's Christmas jumper day. Matt obviously didn't get the memo. Didn't get memo. Christmas, um, I haven't got time for Christmas. Yeah. So, well, bar humbug. Yeah. Um, so Andy, fair play. Good, yep. good effort. Yep, we're, um, we're, uh, we're recording this today, day after, uh, well, we're three Chelsea fans. We're looking maybe a little bit glum. Uh, we've just been beaten last night by uh, Man, Man United. Any particular, you know, quick thoughts on Chelsea before we uh, get stuck in? Or should we just not bother and uh, well, crack all, on? All I'd say is if you get beaten by Man United and McTominay's their best player, then you, you, know, <laughs> you, you, you know you're not very far down the road in the project then, are you? Yeah, no, definitely. Well, uh, George, used to work with us. Uh, that's for you, mate. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, all good stuff. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, Thank you. We're obviously going to get ready to go for our... Uh, BBA networking no, lunch indeed. today, so uh, Christmas themed up, three course lunch pending. Very nice mm. indeed. Uh, yes. Lots yep. of people coming along. Um, it's obviously been great working with you guys this year. Um, obviously a lot more, lot more closer. We've been talking, obviously about the development funding market. We've done several podcasts now on that with obviously Derek and and others, and obviously Andy. I know you've obviously caught up with Ian on some of the stuff, but. What I wanted to talk about today was kind of stock, and it kind of builds on the conversation I had on the last podcast with Steve Shaw um, from the PX partnership, because as you know, we track the whole of the UK every month for new homes listings, sales, stock, whatever, and um, you know, let's not beat around the bush here, there's, there's quite a bit of stock there right now, um, not necessarily for bad reasons of um, you know, the, the developers at fault, but you know, perhaps some unimaginative marketing. Um, not very creative, so maybe hence have missed out on things like PX. But could we, could we just delve a little bit deeper into maybe what the options are for some of these house builders? Because there's lots of talk, you know, um, lending terms coming to an end, you know, developers maybe are getting presented with some really good land opportunities right now. Um, yeah, let's let's talk. Oh, definitely. Do you want to okay. Um, well, that's, it's, it's quite a broad topic to talk about, isn't it? Um, Yes, I, I think um, anybody who's been uh, developing or had a development going for the last couple of years, probably now, is at a situation where they're going to go, what am I going to do next? Um, and as you quite rightly say, it's not just about how do I exit where I am at the moment, it's about the opportunities that are undoubtedly going to come along and they want to take advantage of. Keep the team working together, keep people moving on, move on to the next site. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's how you find that right exit that not only takes you out of where you are at the moment, it gives you time which uh, any developer is going to want, uh, but also releases you some cash to to, to move on into the next uh, development. Well, what's the mood of the lenders at the moment then that maybe have the senior debt to start with? So are you the first lender in? Um, they've helped that developer get to that point. Maybe sales have been a little bit... It's challenging. Um, you know, a lot of them arguably start in a good, positive market. You know, A lot of people would have started when you still had help to buy in place, <coughs> different government op options in there. And then you're coming to the end when you don't have that option available. Rates have spiked and gone up. So affordability is a bit of a burden for most people. So you lose a percentage of people that could come in and buy. The reality is it takes a bit longer to sell. And if you haven't been prepared for that, or maybe your agents that you've got in place weren't prepared for that, things stall. And as of, you know, if you're the senior lender in there, whilst you can sympathize, the reality of, lending is that you have to get the money back at some point the benefit is for people out there at the moment who are maybe a little bit stuck there is a good appetite for rebridging a facility that's come to the end and reached pc so it's not all doom and gloom there are opportunities out there and look i guess that's the big thing for me obviously i'm i'm hugely positive i want to kind of um you know give confidence to clients and stuff like that you know there's probably a few developers i certainly know that we've been talking to Probably having a few sleepless nights, a bit hairy. What do we do? What are the options? Probably feel a little bit isolated, lost, or whatever. And obviously, this is where it's good to talk. Yes. Um, and I know we've obviously spoken about one recently where a client sort of buried his head in the sand and and what have you. But yeah, what 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 do the refinance options look like? Give, let's give a bit of positivity, a bit of hope. Um, to some of these guys that are weighing up their options right now. Well, well, I was about to be a little negative and say that it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't that long ago where you go, I'll buy to let it. 
and that buy me time. And if, if you've got a strong rental market at the moment, you might think that's the way I want to go because there's you know there will be a demand from you know the rental side of things. But obviously that spike in rates means the affordability calculations for buy to lets are now probably will mean that they can't they can't leverage enough no. on a, a, a longer term debt to get out of where they are at the moment. That was always the oh well I, I can't sell I can always buy to let it. Well that that route's gone. Um, so that was the negative thing I was going to say, but I do think um, there is a, there is a, a real market for um, lenders seeing what one could argue actually a lot of the risk has already been taken out because mm. the development is finished yep. and you've got saleable completed units. Um, and as long as they're not too highly leveraged, then there are lenders out there undoubtedly who will go who have a, see an opportunity actually to probably um, en- end up with clients that they probably won't normally get in front of. Because they are they are still very good quality clients that unfortunately for reasons that are completely beyond their control and a lot of what is happening at the moment is beyond everyone's control. Yeah. Um, you know they wouldn't normally see. So there are opportunities, and I think the some lenders do see that. Um, yes, there will be lenders out there who will take a perhaps a, a more negative spin on world, the world than I just did. But there will be uh, there will be those out there undoubtedly who see this as an opportunity to uh, get a, a stronger foothold in the market with a, a caliber of client that they wouldn't have seen before. Yeah, and we've also seen that with new product launches. So it's not like lenders are sat still. I mean, we're getting bombarded daily, often with repeated emails from the same lenders just talking about new product sets. Well, I think you said before there's quite a lot of money out there, isn't there? Yeah, there's the d- yeah, there's mm. definitely an abundance. There's as Matt sort of. Um, as recently said, there's so many lenders out in the market and there's still new people coming to market. And in addition to all of that, existing lenders are constantly looking at new ways to get more funds out the door. And for people that have kind of come to the end and they're kind of feeling that they're missing opportunities, we have seen that the buy to let market is harder, but people are being more flexible. So you can do kind of like a part serviced, part rolled facility where that will benefit with the stress testing, enable you to at least exit the facility and get some deposits behind you as well. Do you think there's a few developers though that are kicking the bucket down the road in the hope for another day? I was talking to somebody the other day that was saying, well, he was going to do a um, an interest only with Avamore, I think it was, or, or somebody like that. Um, it, the rate looked quite low, but by the sounds of it, the fees at the back end of it are going to be pretty chunky. Is that just kicking the bucket down the road in the hope or...? I think I, th- I think you're right. I think the the point is there's there is no point in actually taking further finance if you don't actually change your <coughs> mindset and maybe the way you market or yeah. have a look at what you're going to do to exit because all of a sudden you're just going to happen in six months time, nine months time, maybe years time with the same issues, but probably more in more debt. Um, so I, I think if if I'm talking to a developer at the moment who wants to do something like that. The exit of the exit then starts to become key, mm. and you then you know you, you you then get into their their mindset, and as you say, are they burying their head, just kicking the can, or are they go right? If I have more time, you know, I'm going to come to someone like Thomas May. I'm going to get some advice. I'm going to see how I'm going to market this differently, um, you know. And uh, you know, if someone <coughs> says to me, "Well, I'm just going to change agents," I often think, "Well, kind of so what? What's what's what are they going to bring to you, bring to you that the previous agent didn't? And why did you choose the first agent?" You know, in the first place, I, I think there's a really some really good examples. Of that it's actually quite apt because we've got a client coming in later on today that um, got a fantastic site. They built an incredible product, really good. Probably been unlucky with the market. Um, probably fell into the trap that they went for probably the cheapest agent. Probably thinking the market's good, anyone could sell, um, and ended up actually kind of spoiling what was the whole dynamic of tactics, strategies, or whatever. We're now coming in we're looking at a higher fee and it's not just about a higher fee for the sake of a higher fee it's all about the value add stuff that we're chucking in so we're talking about you know proper video proper social media marketing we're talking about really getting this reach which when you look at it and you analyze some of these numbers and we've had on another project that we're mutually involved in where let's face it visited sales ratios are much higher now than than they would have been when there were initiatives like help to buy there so we've got to organically get a lot more visitor traffic through the door to have half a chance of building a chain or creating a sale, whether PX or whatever. Um, And I think that for a lot of these developers that have sat there, and it's quite interesting when you look at the analysis going back to, you know, February time, there's stock that's still listed and has not had a price adjustment since that time. Well, if you look at what the second-hand market's been doing, that's been adjusted probably several times in yeah. in that period. And a lot of people also don't 
present the property as being finished. You know, it's sort of, it's not staged for lack of a better word, but lots of people joke about it. You know, we've all watched Selling Sunset. One of the good things that they do is they stage everything. They don't mm. leave it to the imagination because often if you go to a building site to look at a show home, you're very aware that you're at a building site looking at a show yeah. home. It, it needs to be brought to life, finish a bit of landscaping. It doesn't have to be all of it, but some of it. And you can make the feeling of entering as if it's going to be when it's finished. But it's often those things we, we're talking to clients about what's left to be done. I can guarantee landscaping and some of the externals are always the things left till last. But as someone turning up to view the property, it's the first thing I'm going to see. But we've got a, we've obviously got a case in point that we're working on at the moment with you guys that, you know, um, developer has brought, brought a main contractor in. The contractor's delivering the project. As far as they're concerned, it's go, go, go. Um, no one's really been driving sales strategy in necessarily the right way. As a result, that's all going to become stopped. There's no consequence for that contractor. Whereas what I'm absolutely stuck, staggered by is that there was nothing in that process that said, right, at this point, we're going to be able to deliver a really clear customer journey. We're going to be able to walk them into a show apartment or show house and, and kind of be getting on selling rather than at the moment what's going to happen they're all going to be built exactly the same time all going to be practical completion you're going oh my god like this is a you know it's, it's crazy like all that all that stuff the market all at once oh it's also crazy that the contractor can be in sort of that position of kind of dictating to ultimately the developer of you know of how things are going to be and, uh, and also there's an element you know and i can say this now that i'm not on the lending side but there's an element that sits with the lenders you know every lender looks at the particulars for that site on the front end and always built in there as a sales and marketing cost no lender covers that cost because it's taken out yep. of the profit on the sales so we don't look at the strategies as a lender i don't consider the strategies as a lender i don't ask who the agents are i'll see you know how did you get to your mm. figures i spoke to these three agents that's as far as it goes so everyone enters it arguably blind and then at the back end if nobody's looked at it everyone just looks around pointing fingers no one actually looks in the mirror to go okay we all kind of missed a trick on this and we should have been doing this six months earlier. Mm. I definitely think it's part of the conversations I have with clients now is much more around projects. Great. But what's the abilities that we're going to bring in with set agents? Could you say in the plan in you know, month eight, you're expecting this number of sales and month 10 and month 12, where are they coming from? How are you mm. generating that? If it's through a show home, when's that going to be ready? Are you starting with that? And then again, we talk about the landscape and the overall visuals. I mean, there's a lot more that people can be doing to help themselves. And you, you said it a minute ago where, you know, stock that's on there hasn't been updated. I mean, mm -hmm. we looked at some of a couple of months back where the site's been finished for six months, but online on Rightmove, they're still showing images of the scaffolding up. Yeah, it's... It's, uh, it's, 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 it's beggars it's, belief. Like, it, it's why? the thing that gets my, uh, gets my blood boiling when I, <laughs> when I look at it. And uh, the other obvious one is when somebody still says that the show apartment or show, show house is launching on the 16th of June. You think... I mean, September, <laughs> it's like, you know, are you, is this, I can't believe this stuff still, still yeah. goes on, but, but it does. I think the big one on me, for me on that, um, Andy, is kind of coming back to the pricing and, you know, we do this pricing at the outset and our, the great sort of thing we always try and instill into our agents and the clients we're working with is that we're going to be very uh, pragmatic around pricing and we're going to make sure that every quarter we update that pricing. Now, what you hope, and I'll just go back to the sort of 208 market, was that actually developers really valued that because the finance director would be able to adjust their numbers and, you know, write it down rather than being that horrible pill later down the line when all of a sudden we have a big, big price decline. How do you think developers and sort of uh, lenders react to that? Because clearly, obviously, it's all about getting the money out and getting on in this huge amount of positivity, but... I, I think um, lenders, banks, lenders don't like surprises. Yeah. And of course, and as Andy's touched on, you, when you, when you, you, and I've sat on credit committees, so I, I know you ponder at length over the initial presentation, bill costs, how many pound per square foot, is it this, is it that, is that realistic for that area, can they deliver? And there's a lot of concentrate, oh yeah, we'll give them six months at the end of the sale. Mm. And, and it's quite right. You never go into, well, actually, how are they going to do that? How are they going to, how are they going to achieve that? And they have this one, as you say, wonderful cash flow. Month twelve, there's going to be three sales. Then, there's, well, what happens if you don't? Where is yeah. it going to? But no one thinks about that. It's because there is that. Let's get the money out the door. Let's support them. And then, but to have that, then go. Oh, by the way, um, you know, halfway through the development, they can see that the the sale prices are starting to drop a little bit 
then you get a concerned lender who's going to go, well, my my loan to value at the end is going to be out, you know, and then they'll, they'll get after the borrower and go, well, you might have to put some more money into this. So actually, I, I'm not sure how well it would be welcomed, um, but you'd like to think that any valuation you get at the moment is realistic enough. Um, one could argue, uh, if you were a valuer, how can you tell what the prices are going to be in 15 months' time, 12 months' time? But if I was a lender now, I'd be, I'd be wanting that information. And then you, then as a lender, you've got to basically be grown up about it and go, okay, well, at least we know. As long as they're on track, they're going to deliver. We're going to get our money back. They're going to make a few quid. If prices have dropped off slightly, well, then let's work together mm-hmm. and not have some massive panic attack, which lenders can have, going, oh, what's going to happen now? Oh, my God, the loan to GDV is going to be out. Oh, you know, we'll, we'll stop. Mm-hmm. We're not going to fund this anymore, which is counterproductive for everybody yeah. but I've seen it happen yeah. and, and that's when um, that's when hopefully the, the experienced people in this market will come to, a fore, come to the fore um, we've certainly got a huge amount of experience in BBA and I think a lot of some of the lenders certainly have uh, that's when the, the pragmatic approach the, 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 the real approach not just looking at figures and hiding behind them going right how do we support our borrower through a difficult period and get out the end of it and not just basically hit the hit, hit the stop button and cause problems for everybody. Yeah. So let's talk about this refinance option then, you know, um, <clears throat> developers got their stock, looking at sort of, maybe the lenders starting to tap them on the shoulder a bit, things haven't yeah. quite happened as they wanted or... Well, that's kind of what yeah. I was about to say around sort of, as you said, obviously at BBA, everything that we're doing for lenders is always produced on that presentation pack, which is in granular detail around what they've achieved to date, including this project, but also what's happened, what's effectively gone wrong, because there's always going to be stuff that you didn't account for. And that's, you know, the MS can't account for that in the lead up. The surveyors can't account for it. They can only assess there and then. So even the future GDVs, they're based on today's market. You know, you can't hold people accountable Mm. for changes in the market. And, you know, we had some very fun changes in the market, thanks to the government last year, which arguably we're still kind of reeling on now. So those elements do make it more difficult but it's not impossible. And if it's presented in the right way from the outset so that you don't leave any stones unturned, then a lender has a full picture. They can understand what they've spent to date, what they've borrowed to date, where they see the GDVs going, how much more is left to be done. And each lender does it slightly differently, but the key part to all of that is understanding the loan to cost so far, how they're going to exit, and that's where the conversation around who is in charge of the build, are we still confident they can deliver it, with the money that we're going to give you, is that truly enough? Has it got a contingency in place for it? But then equally, the agent that is involved. And if it's the same agent, the key has to be, what are they doing differently? Differently, yeah. But the problem is, I don't think enough people ask that question because oh, the, the, the agent's on it. But no one actually knows what well, I think, they're on. I think very often what we're finding at the moment is that the developer has almost been conditioned of what the excuses are that the agent's laid up. And it's not until we're looking at things, you know, we we looked at one up in Yorkshire only probably a month, six weeks ago, and you're looking at it and going, well, blimey, all of these have got reefs on. Second phase has now been stalled. They're six weeks away from practical completion, but everything's stopped. And the perception is that it's the markets, nothing's happening. Well, they weren't offering part exchange. The presentation was absolutely diabolical. Um, And the, the way that they were presented online was well off well off piece um now new agents come on board and absolutely injected a whole new uh, you know amount of enthusiasm vigor whatever no surprises good old fashioned agencies kicking in we're building chains we're chain breaking we're doing all these different initiatives whatever it may be and developers sitting with a couple of reservations under the belt well you think well you know it's like the blind leading the blind yeah. at times isn't it you think well, how's that happened? Are we still in the market where oh, I've got to use that agent because they found me the sites? Well, I think I think there is, but I think you know we would we would support that methodology if the agent is going to deliver to the scope of work that they say they're going to. Yeah. Now, quite clearly, well, if I'm the developer and my back's against the wall and I'm under pressure and the agent's not performing, no surprises, Mister Agent, you're going to get kicked off. Um, and I think you know this is the thing evident in one of the projects we've been involved in. The you know. Okay, that agent got disinstructed now, but they were doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, we often hammer the developer for it. You know, if you kind of liken it to football, you sort of got your, your ownership being the lender, your manager being a developer, and then your main contractor being the players. 
arguably, you know, Chelsea, for example, we bring back Lukaku. <coughs> Everyone wanted him back. Doesn't perform. But we don't hammer the player for it. We absolutely hammer three managers in a row for it. Mm. Well, it's not their fault that one person's not performing and the whole team yep. are disillusioned. What, what's coming upwards and more importantly, what's coming down the track? Where's that level of support? And I think we need that in a development world. And that's where a lot of the lenders that we'll go to for these development exits, they are very supportive. They understand the need for the leverage. They understand and can take on board what's gone wrong. And then they can work with you to change up the agents. Because again, it's all about the time. Mm. It's, but know, are, those, are those lenders... Are they delving into that? Are they looking, for, you know... The right ones are, yeah. So I was going to say, cause but that's they should because they're be. led by, you know, our approach isn't a transactional one. It's yeah. very much relationship-driven. And that's not just relationship with our clients. More importantly, it's relationship with our lenders. We have to be able to pick up the phone to them. There's not a lender that I've placed a deal with this year that I've not been able to pick up the phone to and explain, I know your criteria, this one's slightly out of the box for this particular reason, but here's why I'm backing the client. And we get them on board that way. Now, that might be because we need them to stretch above 70% and go to 75 We might need to take a bridge where there's a bit of flexibility on the sales proceeds because typically every lender will take 100% until their debt's redeemed. Some will do a bit of a profit share, whether they take a 90% or 80%. So, again, it can just free up some of that cash flow for the clients during, but we have to come through that together. Okay, I'm going to need my math washing out after asking this question, but I'm going to talk about rates and obviously we're talking about refinancing. Look, is it expensive and what are the options that developers should be looking at? I think it's the way I look at actually bridging rates, short-term rates are probably back where they should have been. And in fact, actually looking back, they've been, they were cheap. So if you're back around about the, the 1% a month, mark, maybe slightly more than that, traditionally that's where bridging has always been. And maybe that a reward reflects the risk that the lender is taking. Yep. Um, it, it, it does mean, I think, that a lot of lenders have had their margins significantly cut because of it. But that's where the market seems to be at the moment. Okay. And what's the um, lender's appetite for new, new projects? How are they? They, they, they do seem to be there. It comes back to my earlier point. This is an opportunity. Yep. Because there, you know, there will be some very good developers out there who now are looking for a home, which maybe two years ago, a year ago, they wouldn't have needed to, but now they're looking. So the, the right lenders, the lenders that are properly funded, and that's key in this market, it's how they're funded, um, will sit, we'll have that, you know, that, that demand there that they want to they get the money out the door. Yep. Yeah, and that demand is definitely strong. I mean, I've yeah. obviously got a connection with one of your agents down in Alton, so they've introduced me to a guy that's looking at a scheme. GDP is probably going to be about 11 and a half million. And typically he's been with one lender for the last 17 years. But like all lenders, especially in a challenging market, you can't always be as giving with your top 1% of borrowers and clients. Yep. So they're being a bit more, I guess, a bit more normal in their approach with how they treat his build costs and his contingencies and everything else. So we've been asked to have a little look. Now, I've got three lenders that will give more money day one, more money towards all of the costs, including professional fees, slightly cheaper on rate. And we got those back on Tuesday. And I've had a call every day different ones of those lenders, asking, how do I win it? What if I reduce the rate? Right. So in the last three days, we've lost 50 bips across the board on rates just because they want to work with this client. So for the right scheme and the right developer with good experience, the appetite is probably stronger than it's ever been. Because I think What's so good about that project then? Location, you're within to Waterloo within 90 minutes, um, local amenities, main, main roads in, it's a block of... 34 apartments, which is drastically needed. It's suitable for the location it's going in. There's other developments around it that it complements. It's so got all the right, it, all the right ingredients. All the right things. And don't get me wrong, that's a bit of a unicorn to have everything on one deal. Mm. But that is due to the calibre of, of the client. Yep. You know, They only take on local projects to them. And they don't kind of step outside of that. In terms of the overall cost, as, as Matt said, yeah, costs have, have gone up. Do I think they're expensive? No, I agree. I think they they cost what they should. Um, borrowing money shouldn't feel like it doesn't cost you anything. Yep. And arguably, for the last 12, 13 years, we've, we've kind of had our cake in. And, yep. isn't it? and We do need to get used to the fact that borrowing has a cost. But I think too many people focus on the rate. And if you focus on you know, base rate, as an example, it's five and a quarter. Well, if you keep comparing that to when it was 0 0.1, yeah, it's going to scare yep. you a little bit. But actually, what's the pound and pennies of that? And most importantly, what's your profit margin? 
if it costs you 28% per annum, but you're still making a 19% profit on debt, arguably that's a good return based yeah. on inflation and what you get in a bank on savings. You know, I think the best savings account at the moment is what, about six and a half, seven percent 7%. You know, you're only just now beating inflation on that. But if you can make 15% plus whilst borrowing your money from a bank, to me, that's do, like do you see that rate position changing much in Q1? No, not dramatically. Obviously, we're what a week away from the MPC meeting. I, I'd like to think it stays base rate stays flat where it is at the moment. Yeah. I can't see it spiking. Certainly not going to drop, but I don't see it spiking. I think lenders maybe will reconsider some of their margins, especially those that have struggled to get new business out the door. And I think there'll be a lot of lenders this year that have underperformed versus previous years. Whether they choose to stay in the market will be interesting for the year ahead. But no, I think roughly 1% a month on the sort of bridging space will stay the same. Development is still quite a big swing. It's anything from a flat 10% per annum through to 13%. But that's dependent on your experience and the leverage that you need. Yeah. But again, that's just focusing on a rate and not focusing on you, your project and your profit. And I think that's where our review as a brokerage at BBA becomes key because yeah. we'll have that upfront, honest conversation, not trying to hide anything. The cost is the cost, but more importantly, what's your profit? Because that arguably makes it a good scheme or a bad scheme. I think the, the, the competition point that Annie makes also then feeds into the, the mortgage market. And if you look at the Sonia rates for two and five years, they're now dropping down, you know, I think, I think I saw yesterday getting towards 4%. Right. Mortgage companies aren't going to stop lending, but they need to lend the same as short-term lenders mm. do. So that's a very competitive market and you're going to see rates coming off, which in, you know, if you think it, you wouldn't have to go back too far and everyone's going, oh, it's mortgage rates, six, seven, eight percent they're going to be. Well, they're now heading towards four, yeah. um, which is going to make people feel a bit better about life. It's going to become more affordable. So that will then, it's going to feed in through, hopefully into a more positive outlook. So our developers can now see a better route out. There's going to be more people thinking about, I've got to January, February, end of January, February, I actually have been putting off that move that I wanted to make or wanted to get my, our first house. Now maybe is the time. I think it's going to, you know, rates aren't going to go back to where they were. Mm. So if they're going to sort of bottom out at about three, three and a half, something like that, and you can get four now, maybe now now's the time. If you've got the deposit, and that's a, quite a big if in this market, mm. if you've got the deposit now, maybe the time to, to steam into your, your major house builder and go, right, I'm going to do a deal. I can buy my first house. We can move up, you know, and let's see what we can do. Um, that that may be a positive outcome of it all, um, but um, I would be surprised if base rate moves either way. I was, talk, I was actually talking to somebody um, who runs a mortgage brokerage, um, specialised quite a lot in new homes, I'm talking last week, and it was quite interesting. He's actually sent me through a sort of, sort of monthly update on rates, and we're talking about first-time buyers and what we're going to happen there. It sounds like some interesting developments perhaps coming through from the lenders. And I guess, you know, just from your point of view, chaps, you know, what, what's your view on the, you know, how are developers viewing the consumers? Because ultimately, you know, they're the people that are buying these houses, you know, do, do you get a sense that they're actually feeling a bit more upbeat about 2024 and what might be coming? Or I posed a question to earlier on, are we at the bottom of the market? We probably, <laughs> uh, we probably have different, different views. I know certain agents think we have and you probably disagree, but you know, yeah, what's, what, what's your sense on the consumer market? And I, I think it's, there is a, there's a, my sense is there's quite an element of wait and see pick up on my previous points. We don't want the waiting. We don't want the waiting, <laughs> we don't but people wait are going to wait. But yeah. it's one of those things where it, it becomes a, a snowball, doesn't it? Once someone jumps in and goes, right, I'm going to buy now, it's it's amazing how many people will follow that. And it's that, you know, people sit, sitting around the dinner table having a chat, oh, yeah, we're going to buy. Are you going to buy? Oh, yeah, because we've got a fantastic deal over there. I've got a good rate on my mortgage. But they think, oh, okay, yeah, we that move we're going to make, we're going to pull from that. Maybe we should go and have a look now. Mm. Um, and if you are in a position to move, there are, I, I think there are some very good opportunities. I know looking locally to me and I'm watching some of the prices drop and drop and drop and then all of a sudden the sale kicks in. A house literally just around the corner from me probably has gone for more than a quarter million than less than it was first listed for. Right. So you go, someone's got a bit of a bargain there. Yeah. Someone's dived in and gone at that price, I can't afford not to. Yeah. And I think we're going to see those and that becomes then a spiring effect because then if there anybody, if there any, anybody's like my wife, and you're watching the market every day to see which properties are coming on, what's selling, what's being reduced, as I'm sure people do, then you know that people are watching and waiting. Yeah. And around us, there is not a lot of stock on the market. Um, and you can't wait forever, though, can you? Sort of. Well, we were saying this the other day about you know, it's like people say, well, we're at the bottom of the, bottom of the market. You're not going to know that until 
coming back out the exactly. other end, until, are you? Until you're not, yeah. It's, um, I, 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 I suppose it depends what, what motivates you. I mean, the fact is we're all property people um, and we live where we live because we choose to and we're not, you know, people actually have factors. If their job moves, if they move, if, if they want more space because they've got a family, all those sorts of things, which you can't necessarily put off. Um, um, so, you know, you, you think, right, now I've got to go because I need, I've got that child on the way or uh, we need more space or granny's coming to live with us or all, the, all those options that, you know, uh, that life throws at you, you've got to go and you can't necessarily well, hang on. That's different from maybe the way that we look at the market as property professionals, uh, isn't it? Probably also different to the way, like, you know, lenders will look at it and, and that side of things as well. But, you know, the argument is always a property is ultimately worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Yeah. Your willingness to pay for it is what you're able to borrow your ability to borrow is dictated by so many uncontrollables that often you're kind of just left waiting, whether you want to wait on or not. I think, you know, you mentioned about being at the bottom of the market. I would, you know, somewhat pessimistically say we're probably heading towards it. I don't think we've quite got there yet. But then that's also contrasting by, are we talking about the need market or the want market? Because most people need a two to three bed. Mm. A lot of people, like my wife and myself, we want a four or five bed. Those are two very different places to be yeah. looking at property. Um, but I think also, you know, when we were in much easier times, lending wise, that was maybe a bit of a blurred line. You know, there was a lot more four and five beds coming to market. We had, we had a lunch for a client yesterday and um, they were looking at their own sort of situation and um, this right, the fixed rate mortgage is coming to an end in February and all of a sudden they're looking at how much more their mortgage is going to be and they're weighing up now that balance well actually can we even afford that jump in the mortgage or actually you know are we going to need to downsize because they're in a big lumpy house right now and all of a sudden it's dawned on them blimey that's quite a quite a jump and I guess that will probably sort of invigorate a bit of the market activity yeah. as well if stock and definitely you know needs yeah. and stuff like that won't it but yeah and it plays a part and ultimately that plays a part in where developers choose to develop and what they choose to develop. And, you know, again, we're always rolling on a bit of a lag because everything that we decide today with any of our developers, we're always talking about 15, 18 months time. So it's yeah. kind of hard to really know where those kind of peaks and troughs will be. But what we do know is that since, you know, going back as far as the 40s, we know the property trends. We know how property goes. There's X number of people. We have never hit a housing target per year we currently don't even have a target uh, there's always a lack of stock so you know you then put that into the fact that we've got so much stock on the market I think there just lacks creativity and I know from some of the partnerships that we've spoken about actually there's quite good innovation out there I just don't think it's been explored no. fully yet and I think that's going to be key for next year actually a lot of that's been realized that you know we've done it a set way for so long Actually, we need to be a bit more creative. Yep. And if we can do that for 2024, I think the market comes back as strong as it always does. Cool. Yeah, I th I th but that means that some developers are going to have to hold their hands up and go, do you know what, I've got it wrong. And that's yes. no one ever wants to admit they've got it wrong. No. But anybody who is big enough to go, yeah, do you know what, I have and I, need, and I need help. And it's always that thing about asking for help and do I need to go somewhere else or have a different look at the way I approach. Builders are very good at building. And there's always, and what we talked about earlier, the, the bit at the end, the important bit at the end often gets forgotten about because I'll just give it to an agent and it'll Yeah, and that's, well, we sit with, you have a great finished house and the landscaping's been left behind and <clears throat> site presentation and all these other things. You know, oh God, it's just well, so I mean, basic. It's, it, it's um, unfortunately, and uh, um, in, in previous lives where I've ended up having to take possession of sites and things like that, you often walk on and it's those things around the edges yeah. that the first thing you have to do is think, right, we've got to finish it. Now, why wasn't it finished? Because they ran out of money because they spent it all on somewhere else or, you know, or, or whatever, a whole host of reasons. But as a lender, you end up putting your hand in your pocket and finishing it out of your own resources because you know the best way to get something sold yeah. is having a finished product that looks good and not that's tired, not that's, you know, been sitting around, you know, I think was the, the example you gave in Yorkshire, just sitting there. Um, well, because yeah. nothing's happening, so nothing's happening. Yeah. So um, then it will be those developers who can go, who embrace that, I think, will do very well. And those that continue to stick their head in the sand and stick to the good old ways, or possibly the bad old ways, you might call them now, will be the ones that will get left behind. Cool. So I'm going to put you on the spot now. I'm going to ask you, what's your, what's your takeaway highlight from 2023? Uh, positive. Uh, and what's your... Um, What's your big thing for next year? What's your, what are you going to be focusing on for next year? What, what, do you, what's, what are you 
would you see the land of opportunity for you guys for next year, Andy? Uh, the land of opportunity, I think, for, for us and mainly our clients will be the fact that there is a need to exit sites to not miss opportunities. The good news on that is that there's plenty of lenders that are in that space that want to be lending yep. money and exiting. So that's, that's going to be next year's key yep. drive for most lenders. I mean, the biggest highlight from this year is those key relationships. And, and you know, half, literally halfway through the year, I switched from lending side to the brokering side. And I've been astounded at who I've cemented relationships with from certain lenders. And, and mainly that's based on the fact that they are quick to respond. They're eager to get the right terms, accurate terms. They want to know the detail. And ultimately, they stick to what they say that they're going to do. Um, those, yeah, those key relationships this year have been a you know, really good win. Yep, cool. How about you, Matt? Well, I suppose a bit, um, bit like Andy. I've, I've you know, I've uh, now the, the poacher that was the gamekeeper, and I've moved over to the dark side of broking. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, what's been what I'd forgotten about in my career is those relationships. When I first started in in property all those years ago, back in the nineties, where it was, you know, some would argue easier and great fun and a lot less regulation. Um, those relationships that we built then, and yes, it was cemented over a beer and in the restaurant and all that sort of stuff. I, you know, I'd moved right away from that. So to get back out there and re-establish relationships, actually a lot of people I knew back then, crazily, they're still in the market as well. Um, I've really enjoyed, and I've, I've, re I've forgotten how much I missed that relationship building. So that, that's been really good. And the conversations you have and where it takes you and the people you end up talking to and get introduced to, I, I completely forgotten about. That's one of the problems about being in a, in a specific lender. You have your products. And if they don't tick the box, you don't do it, you lose them, they go somewhere else. Whereas what we're doing now at BBA, it's great. We've, you know, we've got a whole market of products that we can bring to a, a developer. Um, and we're not, we're not tied to anybody. We'll find the best deal. And that won't always be the cheapest. It'll be the best, which will, will get them where they want to be. Um, looking forward to 2024, exactly the same. Um, you know, working with Thomas May, working with you guys, it, it looks really interesting for next year because um, I think we're putting something together that um, no one else has. And we have a, a, a you know, a, a, a unique approach. Um, you know, the, the, the thought so of... It's blended skills, isn't it? It, it is. It's, it's bring it all together. We, you know, we can find your site, we can finance your site, we can help you sell your site, we can help you move on to your next site. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think one of the things that I've always looked at when I've been a lender is, you know, brokerages can be very good, but they get very focused. I've helped you, right, I'm, I'm away. And I can't help, you know, I, I may be able to introduce you, but no, I can't. But we can give that, that whole process. We've got it covered. Um, and because we're covering more and more of the country together as well, you know, um, we will reach out and be in front of a lot more people. Again, it's about relationships, and that's going to be quite interesting, I think. Good stuff. Well, thank you, chaps. Yeah, it's been really great to catch up. Um, we've really enjoyed working with you guys this year. Very much looking forward to really pushing on Absolutely. Yeah. in 2024. I think some really exciting stuff. I think we've sort of got a good measure of what we're, as, yes. as Matt just said, uh, what, our, uh, what our skills are. Um, Obviously, behind the camera today, we've had Chris and TL. I think we've already established that TL falls into a key, cat uh, key character from uh, Jingle All the Way. Um, <laughs> so we'll let our uh, those that know TL, we'll let him work those let you work out who that might be. And <laughs> he's chuckling away here. They're covered in their Santa jack uh, Santa uh, jumpers. And Matt, obviously, before the lunch today, I presume you are going to pop to the market or a shop. And buy some. No, he's going to remain the head teacher for the day. No, I'm really? the head teacher. Someone's got to keep some sanity. In <laughs> okay, <laughs> so standards. Someone's got to yeah. keep the standards. So you're up, dishing yeah. out the mulled wine and <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Well, look, guys, have a great Christmas. Really looking forward to next year. Thanks very much for everything uh, this year. It's no, been great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks very much to our uh, to our guest today, Matt and Andy from BBA uh, Finance. And so we've had a great relationship um, with those guys over the last twelve months, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, seeing what next year un unveils, uh, particularly sort of really trying to bring the finance and the land opportunities together as a seamless partnership. So um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for joining us on today's uh, podcast at The Plotting Shed. And we're looking forward to working with some really great guests as we go into 2024. Thank you. Have a great Christmas.